Good evening. My name is Malcolm Young, and I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and welcome to Grace Cathedral Online, our forum series of religious thinkers who are talking about faith and the important issues of our day. Every year, the cathedral chooses a theme to reflect upon, and in 2020, our theme is bridges. Throughout the year, we are talking a lot about how we form connections with people and how we can reach across real or perceived divides that separate us. In the Bible, Jesus and the prophets criticize powerful people in society for their injustice toward the poor and vulnerable. What do the ancient words of scripture calling for change mean for our lives today? What does the Bible have to say to us in the current political and cultural climate? I am joined tonight by Herman Weichen, Professor Emeritus at San Francisco Theological Seminary and the Graduate Theological Union, whose focus throughout his career has been on the exploration of the Gospels for their revolutionary insight. He is the author of Reor The Reordering of Power, a socio-political reading of Mark's Gospel, and The Letter to the Romans, Salvation as Justice and the Deconstruction of the Law. And Herman, I have to also, I mean, like, I don't even know where we stopped in terms of telling all, everybody about all your books. This is one of my favorite books that you've written. Thank it's, you. Thank um, you. It's your John book. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Herman, I, I have to tell you, you're, you're one of my favorite biblical scholars of all time. I, I, will never, I never preach a single sermon on, a, on, a, on John's gospel without looking at the beloved disciple. I think I've read it more than anybody else on the planet. <laughs> I'm deeply grateful. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you very much. It's so good to have you. And thanks so much for making the time to be with us. Um, we're really, really grateful to have you. You know, um, there's so much um, turmoil and so much um, change happening that we've had these huge demonstrations about racism and police brutality in the United States. And I wonder um, what, you, what you're thinking about in terms of what the gospel has to say to us in, in these days. Perfect question, Malcolm. I want to put two uh, current events side by side. Uh, and we're in the middle of both of them. In fact, worldwide, we are in the middle of both of them. The, the more uh, immediate one is the coronavirus. And uh, to, to take a theme from Albert Camus' novel, The Plague, we are living in exile in our relationship to that uh, disease. And yet people are saying we are all in this together. And I like that, but it's not true. We are not all in this together because there are the homeless and the poor and the people of color who are suffering more from this than most of us who are privileged to have homes where we can be safe. So we have a, a dilemma there. We have a, a, a desire for unity because uh, when we walk the streets, people are greeting us, they're coming out of their houses and they're talking to us is something we've never experienced before. So it seems that there is this desire for oneness and yet there is separation. On the other hand, the, the second event that is worldwide is uh, we've experienced that very dramatically, very violently in the demonstrations that have been taking place. And there we have people wanting uni uni unity, oneness. Uh, they want to eliminate racism from hum human relationships. And uh, I ask myself, is there a, a structure that would enable us to move into integration? Because most of us, in fact, I would say all of us are living in a moral order of separation. Uh, that's especially true of the Trump administration. What makes, uh, he wants to build America, make America more great, and he's doing it on the basis of the moral order of separation. And that will never, never work. And he adds to that his uh, revenge on people, his the retaliation that he uh, practices. So there is no possibility of our country ever coming together because we live in a state of separation, of it, us versus them. So what does the Bible have to say to that condition? Uh, 
I would like to start from birth, if I may. Uh, the very first moments that we are born, the umbilical cord is cut. And in those very, very few moments, we are an integrated soul and body. But the, and this is the irony, when our mother takes us into her arms and begins to socialize us, she is drawing us into the moral order of separation. It's the world of either or. Uh, splitting reality into a, into a set of dichotomies. For example, uh, well, the basic one might be soul versus body. But there are others that play a significant role in our lives, and we could talk about those two. One important one would be identity versus difference. Uh, a very important one that, that we need to address right now is culture versus nature. Uh, there's, there are other uh, dichotomies, good versus evil, life versus death, mind versus matter. We live in that world of dichotomies, and yet there is an inclination on the part of people, and we experience that in these demonstrations, to come together and to be one. So how do we get out of this moral order of separation and move into a moral order of integration? Before I say anything more about that, I'd like to continue with what develops as we grow out of our infancy and into a teenage years and into our adult years, because we continue to live in this world of either or, a, a world of separation we all have to establish an identity. And in order to do that, we have to know something about difference. We cannot establish our own identity without knowing what we are not or what we do not want to be and, and so on. A separation begins to take place within us as we work to build a self that is uh, autonomous, that has a sense of self-worth, but it's always oriented towards difference. And the difference can be mild, it can also be uh, strong, the difference could even be violent as it is in some cases. But uh, when we reach our teenage years, we, uh, we have to move out of the identity that our parents have given us during our childhood and we have to establish our own identity but that difference between identity and difference continues. And it continues into our adulthood and throughout the rest of our lives. We have to know who we are and we have to know who we are not. We have to know what we want to be and we have to know what we do not want to be. All of that is separation and it's a world that we live in. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about that? It wants to move us into another moral order. And the question is, is there such a moral order? Is there one that exists, let us say, right alongside of the moral order of separation? Now here's where Christianity has failed us for at least 1,500 years and perhaps even longer because Augustine is largely guilty of uh, the doctrine of original sin that puts us into uh, the identity of a sinner already inside of our mother's uterus. And uh, we grow up, uh, Luther and Calvin embraced Augustine's doctrine of original sin. So the Protestant denominations, as well as Roman Catholicism, are all embedded in the moral order of separation. And the doctrines that we embrace in our intellectual ascent, these doctrines also promote separation. Uh, putting Jesus into the second person of the Trinity moves him away from or out of our humanity. There's a doctrine that promotes separation. And 
so uh, when we uh, go to church, we are really having fellowship with people uh, inside of the moral order of separation, but struggling somehow to attain to a unity, a, 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 an integration, so that we can reach out to each other and live in a world not one of either or, but a world of both and. You know, Herman, during the, on this Monday, we have, we have a Bible study that's online now, and it, you, you describe so perfectly what it feels like. I mean, it's almost like the clogs clicked into place, and that's exactly what it felt like for us. It, it just felt like we were one. I mean, and, you know, there, there are people of different races and different ages and different genders and different sexual orientations, but there was like this, mo and you could feel it, like the spirit was present in that. And, and by the way, your whole answer is why I love your work so much. I, I feel like so many biblical scholars I know, they, they have like a kind of a, like a secret narrative that determines how they do their work. But what I love about your work is that you're, you're, the philosophical aspects of it are, are out there in front for us to see. I've been uh, compelled to move into that. I did teach philosophy a long time ago before I moved into biblical scholarship. So it does play... Uh, an important role. But look at what's going on in reading the Bible today. The evangelicals who are uh, deeply embedded in the moral order of separation as they relate to Trump and the government, they read the Bible literally. And they do not engage in historical research. They do not seem to be interested in what the text may have meant 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. Yeah. Biblical scholars, on the other hand, are oriented towards science uh, and uh, an interpretation that is unaffected by subjectivity. So they, they work hard at producing historical information, which they then apply to the biblical text in an effort to extract some kind of meaning but most of what they do is to produce information. Yeah. I'm trying to integrate a both and, that is a, a subjective reading and an objective reading. And uh, I've struggled to do that in my writings and I find that that is essentially what comes out of the writings of the New Testament. In fact, it goes all the way back into the Hebrew scriptures. And, and that's what I absolutely love about it, because I, I, um, I'm so drawn. I mean, that historical critical method of studying the Bible objectively is something that, 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 that you know, I love the things that I learn from those scholars. But by the same token, there's kind of like an existential element to it, which is just doesn't seem to be part of the conversation at all. And so it was very strange to me, both in seminary and as a doctoral student, that those two worlds are like their, their offices are right next to each other and they inhabit entirely different universes. And, and, and that's, again, like what I appreciate so much about you is that you are clear about where you stand philosophically. I find that there's a difference between what the New Testament is communicating and what Christianity is proclaiming these days. It's supposed to be the gospel, but it's a gospel that really is embedded in the moral order of separation. Uh, yeah. Let's let's use uh, baptism as an example of uh, the Markan story of the baptism of Jesus. Baptism is an event of integration, but baptism as it is, as it continues to be s celebrated in the church, regardless of which it may be, I think it's, it's quite universal, is bringing a child into the family of the church, and the family of the communion of saints. But what we're doing is really bringing the child into the moral order of separation, because the church does not know that there is a moral order of integration, and that baptism is that event that enables people to move out of the moral order of separation into the moral order of integration. And what does that do for us? That opens us into a both and relationship with God horizontally, not vertically or hierarchically, and uh, the other and the other being our fellow human beings and nature 
In other words, it's not culture versus nature. It's a both and. It's culture and nature being integrated with each other. And that's what we need, especially in view of climate change that is lurking right behind the, the plague that we're struggling with right now. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny that you're, you're talking about baptism. I, I've, I've had a kind of a theology of marriage, but I just haven't talked to very many people about. But um, in a way, I, you know, there's one way of looking at the marriage ceremony is like you're making these vows toward each other and you better not violate the vows. And it's all about vows. And there's another way of looking at it is saying, gosh, God has brought these two people together. We're here celebrating that God brought these two people together. And they're just two very different orientations in the service. And one is a, a moral order of separation. And one is a moral order of integration. I just didn't have the language for that before. But I wonder how, how did you discover that? Like, where did that, where did that idea come from for you? Thank you for bringing in marriage, because that, that opens up another aspect of what you and I are engaged in talking about. And, and when one enters into marriage, and it has great similarities with the baptism of integration, one moves from what I would say a faith relationship into a trust relationship. I do not like the word faith, because it is a term that is usually related to verticality, dependence. Uh, that's where evangelical Christianity uh, promotes itself. Uh, it, it wants unlimited forgiveness, dependence on God for unlimited forgiveness and everlasting life. Uh, and these are uh, these are gifts that we expect from God in our relationship of dependency. But in marriage, it's not faith, it's trust. You, my wife and I relate to each other in trust. There's an intimacy there. And I bring something to the marriage and she brings something to the marriage and we integrate that. We, we, we enrich each other in that integration. And if there are forms of separation that we bring with us, and that would be natural because we've grown up in a moral order of separation, we work at helping each other to gain a greater trust. And in that trust, to, to relate that trust to the outside world as well. Uh, this is a gift of the Jewish people to the world. And I need to say a lot about that because this has become very important to me. The Jews gave us the New Testament. Paul was a Jew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were Jews. They were Jews who were giving the gospel of integration. And very soon after the church got started, and I don't know exactly what century that was, but we could start with uh, Augustine. But very soon the church shifted itself from the mor moral order of integration into the moral order of separation. And that's where we have been ever since. And yeah. if we want to find out uh, how long that has been, let us ask ourselves, when did anti-Semitism begin? Right. Because Christians cannot practice anti-Semitism. That's another form of racism, and it belongs to the moral order of separation. I was going to ask you about that. That was just a really, you know, it has been, when I think of your work, I, I, I was thinking, you know, just why is anti-Semitism so persistent? I mean, it, um, it, it just seems like Christianity just keeps draw, being drawn back in these terrible and hate, hateful ways. And I, and I just don't understand why, why it's so persistent over time. Because for... 1,500 years or more, we have been embedded in the moral order of separation. Yeah, and yeah. we do not know that the New Testament is saying, hey, uh, this is a gift of the Jews to the world. And it is, it is a gift that comes out of the Hebrew scriptures and that culminates, gets fulfilled completely in the writings of Paul and 
the four gospels. Yeah. And, and you, you, we have to embrace on. that. You know, when we have the, um, it, it, we just come out of Easter where we have so many readings from John and you know, there are such, there, there are problematic readings in John that have been used in anti-Semitic ways. I wonder what, what do you say to people when, when they talk to you about that or raise that question or cite a particular biblical verse from, from, from John? There's a good verse that uh, uh, you've evoked from me as I've listened to what you've just said. And it, uh, it's a verse that Jesus speaks from the cross in, for, in the fourth gospel, but the church has never done anything with that. And I'm not sure the church really understands that. But one of the sayings that Jesus makes from the cross in the gospel according to John is the words that he speaks to the beloved disciple when he says, uh, I, I, I think he first says to his mother, look, there's your son. Right. And then he speaks to the beloved disciple and says, there's your mother. There you have integration. There, if the young, if, if the beloved disciple is representative of the new moral order, the new moral order is being compelled by Jesus to embrace the Jewish people and to say they are one of us, they have given us this gift of integration, and we need to thank them and embrace them because that is their gift to the whole world and to us as well. I, I'm so glad you brought, brought that up because I, I, I think about it so, so often. We, we had this horrible reading in the, in the, in the cathedral at, at an Evensong service, and one of um, my daughter's classmates was visiting um, you know, to explore other religions and, you know, went to her rabbi and went to her dad. And, you know, and, you know I, had, I had nothing to say except, I'm sorry, we should never be reading that in church. And it did forge a new relationship. I mean, so, so even in tensions and conflict, you know, there is this possibility of that moral order of integration, you know, coming out of that. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you were like as a kid and just how you ended up becoming a biblical scholar and in a pretty unique one at that. Thank you, Malcolm. That's a difficult question to answer because I've struggled to find that, uh, to understand that from my own history. Um, let me start with an analogy. Um, and I want to use the geographical territory of Israel in Palestine or whatever name we want to use to designate that territory, surrounded on the one hand by the empire of Egypt and surrounded on the other hand by the empires of Mesopotamia. And here is this little land that is struggling to uh, remain autonomous and it is developing out of its own heritage, out of its own beginning, uh, a moral order of integration. That's what the prophets are proclaiming, integration, integration. Uh, but uh, it, the, the kings that finally, uh, let me back up a minute and say, uh, uh, in, in the brief uh, life of Samuel, the people, the elders of Israel come and say, we want a king. Right. And uh, Samuel is very distressed about that because he wants God to be the king of the people. But no, they, they want a king. And uh, he asks God about it. And God says, yeah, go ahead and let them have a king. Now, David is a very unusual king. He is not a hierarchically oriented king. He, he's an unusual king because he is working horizontally in his relationship with God and horizontally in relationship with his people. And that's precisely what makes David a messianic figure. And Christianity, late in the New Testament, we find David being used as a, a Christological figure, but only because he is an unusual king who is involved in practicing horizontality and integration. But the kings that follow, and lately I've been looking at uh, Isaiah, and the two kings in Isaiah are Ahaz and Hezekiah, and they are kings who are, uh, who are, um, who have moved away from David's type of kingship 
and they now have established a hierarchical order. They are back in the moral order of separation. And when uh, the, the northern kingdom uh, of Israel allies with, with, uh, with Damascus and, and, and raises an army to move south to conquer Judah to replace Ahaz with a puppet, uh, Ahaz is nervous and Isaiah says he's shaking like the trees. And so Isaiah says to Ahaz, go to God and ask God for a sign. And Ahaz says, no, I will not do that. Uh, the sign is important. God says to Ahaz, test me. Uh, ask for a sign as high as heaven and as deep as Sheol. In other words, God is saying, try me in terms of my infinitude. Let me show you what I can do for you. And Ahaz refuses. Hezekiah is just as bad because uh, the Assyrian Empire is threatening to overrun this little kingdom of Judah. Uh, and, Ah and Hezekiah turns to Egypt and asks Egypt for help. And that arouses the prophets with great indignation. In other words, we, we have a, a movement in the Hebrew scriptures that struggles with this relationship between the moral order of separation that can be related to hierarchical structures and the horizontality of the moral order of integration. Yeah. And, and uh, being, just to go back to baptism again, of being integrated into a both and relationship with God, with the other, with nature and with ourselves, the invitation there that God gives us is test me. Use my infinitude. Right. Uh, let me uh, cite a specific example, and I think you're familiar with this already. In, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples are sailing to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and while they're en route, a storm comes up, and Jesus is falling asleep uh, while the waves are beating into the boat. And the the Biblical text says something very important that helps us to understand what's going on, because we are told he was sleeping in the stern on the pillow. Ah. Now, in the previous English translations, the scholars did not include the definite article, a pillow, but that right. does not help us. The pillow, sleeping in the stern, is where the pilot sits, and Jesus has the paddle in his hands, and is steering the boat, but when he falls asleep, his hands fit, slip off the paddle, and the boat is being tossed to and fro in the sea. Uh, and the disciples are very nervous, and they're fearful of their lives, and they wake Jesus up and say, and say, is there no concern for you that we are perishing? And he says something very important that uh, is, is largely misunderstood. How is it you don't have faith? And we need to ask ourselves the question, is this the right word that, and in English that is being used by Jesus when he employs the word pistis? Right. Or is Jesus asking them, how come you don't have trust? Right. See, to have and faith means to run to Jesus and Jesus, I'm in trouble, bail me out, bail me out. If we go all the way back to Psalm 107, there's a story of a boat uh, out at sea and a storm comes up and the sailors pray to God and God delivers them and they give thanks to God. That's the typical orientation in the moral order of separation. It's dependence. And in, in, in your life, that, that experience of trust, it just, it, 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 it kind of comes naturally to you. It's, it, it's something that's um, you know, more part of your nature than it may be for, for, for other people. And, yeah. and I see that. I think of you um, being the, the kid who spoke German in the schools and, you know, that you were a little bit different from everybody around you. And yet different. through all of that, you had this sense of, of, of trust, you know? I was like that little territory of Palestine where the Israelites had to be concerned about the Egyptians on the one hand and the Mesopotamians on the other. And it was important for them to... Uh, 
live a life of integration that enabled them to call upon God's infinitude when it was necessary. Right. And that's what Jesus is encouraging his disciples in the boat. How come you don't have trust? Why didn't you stand up and calm the wind and the sea yourselves? Right, right. And it, that's, I, I grew up very different because I had come from Germany at the age of two and I grew up at, in, in the 1930s and 40s where it was not a good thing to be German. Right. So I, uh, I had to find my own way and I found it into a relationship of trust. Yeah, my, um, my great grandmother grew up in, in, in Germany as an English speaker and my, um, and my grandmother grew up in England as a German, native German speaker. So yeah, I, I, and it's had this effect on our family. It's still there, like the damage and the, what was done that, that, that harmed us, it's still spinning out through the generations. It's, I think you know, our children's generation probably gonna, aren't gonna have that, but um, how, did you, how did you take that in and, and end up still being the, the, the hopeful person that you are? It somehow it seemed natural, Malcolm, it seemed natural. Uh, I can't understand how I began to interpret the New Testament more or less initially as a moral order of integration. Yeah. When I go back, uh, my very early book was a little paperback on Matthew's Gospel, and already there it was emerging but I was not that conscious of it. But here's a story that really uh, impressed me, and I pushed it hard in my classes. It's Matthew 14, uh, 22, where Jesus has been walking on the sea, approaching his disciples in the boat, and they think he's a ghost, and they are quite uh, agitated. And he says to them, be enheartened, and egoimi is the Greek word, that he uses, right. and all the English translations, the RSV and the new RSV, most English translations destroy the, the genius of that episode by saying it is I, or I am he. Yeah. And they don't, they lose the infinitude of what Jesus is practicing at this moment. He is doing a godlike act, and he, it is not something that he wants to reserve for himself in relation to the moral order of separation. So when he says, I am, Peter then, and here again the English translations, translations fail, Lord, if you are, well, Lord, if you are what? Lord, if you are, I am, command me to come to you on the waters. And Jesus says, come. There you have your integration again. You know, that, that brings another th there's participation in God's infinitude. Right. It reminds me, though, it brings me, I mean, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, too. I, that's one of the things I love about um, the gospel of the beloved disciple. It, it's almost like they're like kind of your neologisms. You're, 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 you're kind of coining words all the way through to kind of, to, so that we don't fall into that trap of, 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 of looking at faith as faith and not as trust. Uh, yeah. Like, how did you find your way to, to that kind of method? I mean, it, it seems really unique to me. Well, I, I grew up in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and that at the age of 15, I left home to begin my studies at Concordia Collegiate Institute, as it was called in Bronxville, New York. And I started learning Greek already in my junior year in high school. And that continued. And I had great training in Greek. And uh, I learned, and I don't know where this started, but I learned to read the text closely. And that's why, as I shared a moment ago, when I looked at the Mark and story of, of Jesus calming the wind and the sea, uh, that definite article, he was asleep on the pillow, was important for me. I learned to read the Greek text very closely. Yeah. And that's true of the fourth gospel as well, because the 
and go and meet the I am right. all over the place. And exactly. You know that yourself. You've done through that yourself. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. The story, here's a good example. The chapter nine, the story of Jesus healing the blind man. Uh, he he rub, rubs some mud on the man's eyes. Uh, he's mixing on the Sabbath, and that's the crime that he's committing. But the man goes and washes himself in the pool of Siloa. Uh, Solo, uh, and when he returns, his friends uh, are puzzled. He seems to be different. And they wonder, is this the same individual? And some say, well, he is. But he says, ego e me. Ah. And in, in all the English translations, it is translated as, it is I, right. or I am he. And once again, we lose that infinitude that's presupposed there because um, he, he at this point has reached a simple I am. I am without any predicates. I am no longer blind. He's lost the predicate of blind. Just think of what, how many predicates we have. I have a lot of predicates. But when I want to, um, to get as close to God as possible, I get rid of, I, I let go of all those predicates and I become as simple I am. And then the question is, what predicates do I add to a simple I am? Yeah. And this is where it gets very radical. Can I say, I am the light of the world? Can I say, I am the bread of life? Right, the true vine. Can I say, and here's a big one, I am the resurrection and the life? Right. <laughs> yes, because in that Lazarus resurrection story, Martha had to have trust, not faith, trust when Jesus said, roll away the stone, because he was already four days dead and in that part of the world, the, the ghost or the spirit had left the corpse and resurrection was impossible. Yeah. But she does that anyway. And so she is opening the door to Lazarus's resurrection. And when he comes forth, he's bound hand and feet. And Jesus needs the bystanders to unbind him and set him free. And that's what Christianity should be engaged in today. Oh, I, I love that. And setting them free. You know, Herman, we have a, like a tradition as part of our forum series, and that is that we invite our, our um, audience to, to um, ask questions. Sure. Um, and so, so our audience is so smart, they're already starting to send questions. Okay. Um, here, is, um, here is one right here. How do you redirect yourself in everyday life when you realize that you're acting out of a feeling or feeling from a place of separation? So how do you redirect yourself from when you're acting or feeling from a place of separation? Well, I have to go back and ask, what does my baptism mean to me? My baptism is an event that transferred me from the moral order of separation into the moral order of integration. That's a rite of passage. That is who I now am. I have to embrace that identity. Let me quote 1 Corinthians 15, 45, where Paul is differentiating two humanities. Uh, and when he's talking to the Corinthians in that resurrection chapter, he says, uh, the first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The last Adam is the new humanity. The last Adam is this moral order of integration and that says to me, I am now a life-giving spirit. And that's the identity that I have to embrace. Wow, I love that. I love that idea that when you feel yourself being dragged back into that separation, you think, I am a, li a life-giving spirit. Yes. Here's yes. another question we have. It's um, this. As Christians, we are all part of the Davidic covenant. Therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ. You would think this alone would eliminate the cur current racism we are witnessing. However, there are white Christians persecuting their brothers and sisters of color who are also Christians. What do the scriptures tell us to do? Well, 
I'm writing a book right now that starts with Genesis 2, 7. That's the creation of the earth one, Adam, from Adama. Adam is from earth. But Adam is not two beings. There's no separation between soul and body. That's what we have done in our moral order of separation. We have divided our soul from our body, and uh, we may want eternal life, but in terms of that division, the most that we could have would be immortality. And there's nothing about infinitude or re re any relationship to infinitude about immortality. But the, new, the Bible is all about resurrection. And resurrection is an integration of soul and body. And, and the, in order for you and me to be raised from the dead after our heartbeats stop and our brain waves cease to function, it's not immortality. It's a, God's work of infinitude, the possibilities of God's infinitude that will draw us as a body into God's everlasting life. And we will be always as bodies. But as Paul says, we, the physical body will be replaced with the spiritual body. But we will always be engaged in that integrated, integrated soul and body, which is a oneness within us. And that oneness within us, we want to share with the rest of the world. So we cannot be racist of any kind if we are truly people who are integrated and integrated in terms of soul and body as a single whole person. And that's who we want to be. We want to embrace that completely and draw the rest of the world into this kind of wonderful oneness that we are sharing with God, with nature, with ourselves, right. and therefore with others. You know, I've been thinking about you a lot lately. You know, when the when um, COVID nineteen first started unfolding, I went back and I read Albert Camus' The Plague. And in my head, you and Albert Camus are right next to each other. And I wonder <laughs> if you can talk to me a little bit about Camus in particular and just your engagement with the existentialist thought. That's a great novel. It is a great novel. The whole time I was reading, novel. I was thinking of you. I, I use that novel to interpret the Apostle Paul's use of hamartia in the letter to the Romans. Ah. Hamartia is used 46 times in Paul's letter to the Romans. And at the seminary I, attend, I attended, I was taught that hamartia means missing the mark. And the analogy right. is a target that's set up and you and I have a bow and arrow in hand and we've got to hit the bullseye, but because we never do, we need forgiveness, and there's your relationship of dependence, right. moral order of separation. So uh, it was Camus who taught me through that novel that um, the, there is a disease. Ta Taru has a conversation with Dr. Rue. Dr. Rue is the physician who's writing this up uh, in, in the city. Yeah, of, he's the uh, narrator. In the narrative. And uh, there's a very important conversation between Taru and uh, Dr. Ru when Taru says, I had the plague long before I came to this city. Yes. And he goes on, and this, this is so profound. He says, oh, uh, it is. It, 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 you know, he says, uh, there are the pestilences and there are the, um, um, I forget the other word that he uses, but those those are the two realities: uh, the disease of the plague and some kind of possibility of health. Only a possibility, because Taru dies of the double strain of the of, of the plague, uh, a real tragedy. But at the very end, in the last paragraph. Uh, Dr. Rue 
is writing the last words to this uh, document that he has written. And he says, uh, the people are out on the streets celebrating the end of the plague, but Dr. Rue knows the plague will never die. It will go into hiding and it, someday it will send its rats forth again to die in the happy city. That's the moral order of separation. Yeah. But in that conversation between Taru and Rue, Taru does say, but there is a third alternative and that's healing. But I, he says, I don't know much about that. And that brings me into 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The second Adam is a life-giving spirit. Right. So, Taru knew something about healing, but he wasn't into it very far. And he realized that the best he can do with the myth of Sisyphus is to keep on rolling that stone to the top of the hill and letting it roll down again and get it going all the way into the valley and starting to roll up, roll it up a hill again because that's the only kind of life that we can expect in this world. And yeah, and there's that. There's one of the characters. He he sees his father in a law court, and, and just like the violence of condemning somebody and and executing them, killing them, capital punishment is what is like kind of what it affects him forever after that. I mean, there, there's something which he can't go back to who he was before he knew about that. And again, that's like that hamartia too, that, that we're part of this, this, this greater disease where we harm each other through racism and through- Yes, you know, yes, yes. Yeah. And even our own personal lives, because if we, if, if, if we do not allow ourselves to be integrated people, integrated in terms of soul and body, then, then uh, we, we we have a certain degree of separation going on inside of us and we need healing for that. And what, what Christianity is offering the world is precisely that healing through integration, integration with God, integration with self, integration with other, integration with nature. That's, yeah. that's what the gospel is all about. And it comes right out of Genesis chapter two, verse seven. That's the beginning of the moral order of integration. And you have that section in the gospel of the, according to the beloved disciple, where you talk about Moses raising the pole in the wilderness and the, the people of Israel have been poisoned by snakes. And, and, and that's just another part of this. We have another question that's come in. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's this, I'm intrigued by your distinction between faith and trust. Is this like a distinction between heart and emotion and trust? Which is based mo most, which is more based on intelligence and reading and reason? Let me try that again. I'm intrigued by your distinction between faith and trust. Is this like a distinction between heart and emotion, um, and trust, which is more based on intelligence and reason? Well, in the moral order of separation, it's easy to separate reason and emotion. Um, I know people who, who do that. They prefer one or the other. It's, again, a world of either or. Which yeah. do we want? Do we want reason or do we want emotion? And people choose one or the other. But in the moral order of integration, both are valid and they can be used in relationship to each other. Uh, and it may require uh, work at harmonizing them so that uh, we are in relationship to these two different realities, whole people, whole in terms of using, here I'll employ philosophical categories, a priori understanding, which yeah. is our subjectivity, and our a posteriori understanding, which we get through scientific and historical research. Yeah. It's the both and. And that's what we were talking earlier about in terms of scriptural interpretation. We're using the subjectivity of a priori understanding, and uh, we're also engaging in scientific research. And th there you have reason and you have emotion, and they both come together when they are integrated in this way. If you um, were to recommend one biblical story or one verse for the president to really study and learn, which would it be? The president, did you say? Yeah, I just thought of that. <laughs> uh, um, 
It's a tough one. I could give you more time to think about it. Uh, well, uh, maybe the last verse of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, yes, I think that would be good for President Trump. Um, uh, you have heard that it was said, um, um, love your enemies. I mean, uh, um, hate your enemies. In um, uh, help me a little bit. Uh, here, let me. Uh, let yeah, me, I love that. I let me look at that up. Oh, here it is. Uh, you you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's Trump. Yeah. In his revenge style of life, his right. presidency. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. Oh, I love that. Thing. Thanks, Herman. Thank Herman, you. have you written any autobiographical things like chapters or anything like that that's out there? No, no, no. Yeah. I have a very unusual life. Um, my father, uh, when he was 10 months old, uh, suffered the death of his mother and he was raised by his aunt. And uh, at the age of 10, he was allowed to come home to his father who had married a second time. His second wife had died in childbirth. He had married a third time. And the third wife had given birth to four children. And she wanted, the third wife wanted one of those four children, a son, to inherit the bakery. But my father was the legal heir to that bakery. Uh, but that was a problem for the family, my grandfather uh, and his third wife. So my father came home to that bakery at the age of 10 and became a baker. But at the age of 20, someone by the name of Dietrich Weichen came to the bakery and said, I have had, I have, uh, my second wife is unable to bear children. My first wife did not bear any children. I need a child to inherit my farm. And the my grandfather, the baker, and his third wife said, you can have our son, Henry, my father. Wow. So at the age of 20, he became Henry Weichen instead of Henry Schnackenberg. 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 And wow. because the farm that he uh, moved to, he had to learn to be farming instead of being a baker. Um, he... Um, he had to go off to a, a place called Lüneburg Heide, where he met a man who was who was involved with this pietistic movement called Christliche Entscheidung, which right. in this country was called Christian Endeavor. Now, Christ, Christliche Entscheidung has been a strong movement in the Lutheran Church, and it's the religion of the heart. Right. Rather than the rational religion of, of 18th century Lutheranism. Right. So I grew up with this religion of the heart, even though, I, and that was a problem for me as a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, into which I uh, entered as, as a student of, um, for the ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always been important for me, but in any case, when my father, uh, be, when my father moved into the farm of Dietrich Wagen, he learned that Dietrich Wagen had speculated in pig farming, and had been gotten into deep indebtedness, and so it was decided in March of 1930 that my father would go to the United States and earn money to pay off the debts on the farm. Wow, that was right in the middle of the big depression. Deep crisis, yes. Yeah. My mother, my sister, and I followed on Labor Day weekend in 1931 before Hitler came to power. Right. Uh, but we were never going to stay. It was never in the plan to remain in the United States. Uh, but my mother became pregnant in 1939, and World War I 
World War II broke out September 1st. We could not go back. So our life changed radically. And I grew up as a, a working hard to become an American. Uh, yeah, and, and you're, very, you're very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking the autobiographical question. No, I, 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 um, I love that story. And I, I think it's so interesting to think you know, the, for part of your life, you just, you didn't need to try to assimilate because you were going to be going back home anyway. That's right. And, and then all of a sudden to, to face the music that this, things aren't going to change. Exactly. I think in a way, that's what you are. You're kind of a bridge builder between the, the past and the present, between the philosophers and the um, biblical scholars. And, and it's, like, it, again, it's another part. You're, it's in your nature to be a trusting person. And it's also in your nature to, to connect these disparate elements. Thank you. You understand that. And earlier, you used the word bridges. Uh, at the very outset of our conversation, you were talking about bridges. And that's, yeah. again, the moral order of integration. We're building bridges. And we're building bridges as life-giving spirits. And Malcolm, if anyone is a life-giving spirit, it is you. <laughs> oh, I know that. Thanks. I've um, learned a lot of it from you. <laughs> you are a remarkable person in terms of being a second Adam, uh, a person who brings life to human beings. Uh, thank you, Herman. Or, or of integration. You're, you're the embodiment of that, Michael. You <laughs> you're very sweet. So what is your message to young people today? Like, you know, you, um, we're going to celebrate your birthday next week. Um, what, is, what do you say to people who are coming up? Um, how do you compare this to what's happening and has happened in the past? You know, what, what is your take? What, you, what gives you hope these days? It's demonstrations and protests. Yeah. It's young people who are saying, no more separation, no more racism. We want a world of unity and union. We want a world of oneness, a world of wholeness. Young people keep pushing for that, but get embedded in what the Jewish people offer us get rid of whatever anti-Semitism you may have and go back and find out that tremendous gift of the moral order of integration. That's our only hope. That's the Jewish gift to the world. Let's give them thanks for it. Yes. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I, I know that when I go back and see those images, which are going to inevitably be in the newspaper of today's demonstrations around the world, it, I, I'm so glad you gave me this language of th that moral order of integration because they are, they're, they're on the front lines trying to bring everyone together. And, and it is really a remarkable time and they're doing remarkable things. It is, it is. It is. And for climate change, let's, let me, t is there time for one quick story? Yes, definitely. Um, Naomi uh, Klein in her latest book talks about uh, wanting to fly from Washington DC to Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, she boarded the jet, but uh, the jet could not move because its tires had gotten embedded in the tarmac because of the heat of the day. So yeah. all the people had to deplane and they tried to get the power of the engines to move the plane out of that tarmac, but the plane could not do that. So they brought in a bigger machine and that machine was able to pull the plane out of that tarmac. There you have the relationship between culture and nature. We rely entirely on culture. The machines we produce, the science we have, all of that has to bail us out. And this is a perfect example of how we are so dependent on science and technology. And yeah. I think we need to think about bringing God's infinitude and the possibilities of God's infinitude into an integration of culture and nature. And that's another thing I appreciate so much about your thought too, is that Paul Tillich makes that harsh distinction between, you know, the kinds of questions that are scientific questions, and the kinds of questions that are religious questions. And, and I, I love the way that you're, you're a natural integrator and in, 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 in the way that you approach those similar, so similar challenges. Sure. We've, we've completely run out of time. We, I, I mean, I, 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 it seemed like our, our, the time just flew by so quickly. It was so good to see you. And thank, thank you, you so much for doing this. 
Malcolm, you are an extraordinary person. I'm so pleased to have this moment with you. Uh, we've had good moments in the past. I wish you God's empowerment and God's inspira inspiration because you've got them already. You are the very embodiment of it and God bless you greatly. Oh, thank thank you, you so much, Herman. Um, so my final announcements, um, please join me next week when my guest will be Joel Rasmussen, University of Oxford professor and editor of the 11 volumes of the philosopher Kierkegaard's journals and notebooks. You can help us bring the arts to life at Grace with a gift today to the forum. Please visit gracecathedral.org slash give to grace. And finally, thanks so much to Herman Weichen, you know, one of my mentors. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you, Herman. Thank thanks for everything. Thank you for this privilege, Michael. Malcolm. Thank you very much. Yes. Good night, thank everyone. You. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.